And this is Daybreak Asia. We're counting down to Asia's major market opens. And look, we finally got there for the Nikkei 225 9089 just in time for Taylor Swift to kick off her four sold out stadium uh, concerts here in Sydney. But uh, Japan is away on a holiday, so we'll be focusing on other things. And they are missing out what is on a what is incredible post NVIDIA earnings rally. Yeah, kind of on brand for Japan, really, to take a public <laughs> holiday. But it is the Emperor's <laughs> birthday. It's just a coincidence. Um, but yeah, were Japan trading today, we might expect to see that tech rally continue. And it's definitely something we're going to be watching out for on the Kospi when we get underway in a few seconds time. But what a rally. All of the indexes in the US now hitting records. Yeah, time and stuff. time again. And a lot of people saying, well, is this the peak? Is this the peak that we see of AI frenzy as dominated by just one name, NVIDIA? And of course, so many of these uh, related names will be the ones to watch as we get into the start of trading. Uh, of course, here in Korea, Japan, as Paul mentioned, offered the Emperor's birthday public holiday. The cost be already popping by almost half a percent as we uh, get into the start of trading there. We see quite a lot of that buying when it comes to foreign investors, which has been really the element that's driven the cost be to become a regional outperformer from one of the worst equity performers around Asia. We're really seeing uh, quite a lot of interest in some of these names, the likes of SK Hynix, right, the chip related names that will benefit from that NVIDIA rally as we continue to see the S&P 500, the Nasdaq 100, the Dow all hitting record highs on that earnings boom from this single company. Seeing the COSDAQ up by about four tenths of one percent, the broader cost be is starting to uh, climb a little bit higher now and we did really see uh, what was broadly a higher day for Asian stocks in the previous session there as well largely driven by tech but with the absence of Japan perhaps a little bit more of a muted session for volumes today. Yeah, well, let's take a look at how we're tracking in Australia and uh, modestly higher, about half of 1%. No surprising, really, that it is information technology stocks, the strongest performing sector here as well. Uh, that sector up by 1.6%. Uh, but the rally fairly broad based in Australia at the moment. It's just a little bit of weakness in utilities and energy prices that we're seeing. And uh, on the subject of energy, uh, crude prices really seem to have... Um, well, they've found, found a flaw, really. They're just trading their $78 a barrel, not, not a lot of movement, and, and really caught in a bind here. On the one hand, there are rising tensions in the Middle East, uh, and on the other, uh, lingering concerns about outlook and particularly demand and consumption uh, from China. So uh, crude prices are really reflecting that, uh, that balance there. We've got the 10-year yield, pretty much little change, uh, 4.162 at the moment. Yeah, take a look at uh, when it comes to bond futures, what we're seeing. Of course, we had more Fed speak and a lot of these top Fed officials really just bolstering the case for markets to stay patient when it comes to expectations on rate cuts, right? The vice chair, uh, Philip Jefferson, saying too much easing could stall progress. We also saw uh, Governor Lisa Cook saying that she wants more evidence of disinflation. The broader picture, really, the messaging, optimistic that inflation is still cooling despite the blip across CPI and PPI in January, but really making it clear they want to see more evidence that it's firmly headed back to 2% before lowering borrowing costs. So more of the sort of same uh, vein of communication that we've been hearing and certainly reflecting the caution that we saw in those FOMC minutes that were out yesterday as well with the risks being seen skewed to what would happen if they cut too early as opposed to what would happen if they held higher for longer. We have seen yields reaching a new year-to-date highs in that Thursday session. The unexpected drop in new jobless claims really reinforcing some of that risk appetite based on confidence in the U.S. economy. Uh, so we also saw kind of the impact when it comes to those huge gains in the equities market and also some new corporate bond offerings as well on the slate, uh, seeing that impact on yields. Traders, uh, as you can see, really further pairing those bets on Fed cuts. The amount of Fed easy anticipated for this year are now at the lowest levels observed so far. 80 basis points were down from uh, a peak of what, around 150 basis points. Let's bring our next guest who is neutral equities more broadly but overweight on US equities. Homan Lee is a senior macro strategist at Lombard Odia. So Homan, uh, the <laughs> enthusiasm, shall I say, seems like I'm downplaying a little bit, but w w what do you make of the Nvidia frenzy? Well, the earnings report uh, was uh, uh, quite spectacular, and uh, it was really the confirmation of the AI theme that we've been watching since uh, late 2022. Um, uh, and, and we think uh, we're basically uh, beginning to see the hint of a, a melt-up scenario for, for the U.S. equities. And 
Um, more broadly speaking, for the U.S. economy, uh, you know, we're also getting, uh, you know, set of uh, fairly solid data. Uh, you know, we, we had the retail sales setback, but the other indicators uh, point to maybe another year of, uh, uh, you know, a, a solid year, um, uh, another year of solid uh, performance uh, for the consumers and businesses. So. What we're doing right now is, uh, you know, when you see a rally like this, first of all, you have to respect the price action and momentum. Uh, so we are, uh, uh, you know, incorporating that uh, in, in our portfolios by overweighting U.S. equities uh, at the expense of European equities, uh, for which we think the macro uh, and policy backdrop uh, are slight, you know, is slightly more challenging. Um, so, so we are making that pair trade, but for the overall allocation. We still think it's uh, important to uh, manage risk uh, and keep in mind that the bond equity correlation has been actually quite uh, favorable to diversify portfolios. So in a portfolio setting, uh, neutral allocation to global equities, but uh, within that equity allocation, uh, we are uh, still uh, you know, uh, overweighting U.S. equities where the, the ingredients of uh, you know, potential equity market melt-up are there. Um, and uh, there are some uh, also comforting uh, signals uh, from both earnings and, uh, uh, and economic indicators. I mean, how do you feel about Asian markets? We're just seeing SK Hynix jumping quite significantly after those NVIDIA gains. And Korea, obviously, is back in favor. And uh, they've got kind of the, the, the double whammy of uh, not just some of the government's optimism, but also a lot of the heavyweights for chip names. Do you like Korea, Japan at the moment? Where do valuations kind of fall for opportunity for you? Well, uh, if we really have to choose between the two markets, uh, I mean, three, uh, two markets in East Asia, you know, between Japan and South Korea, we would still think uh, Japan offers a slightly more interesting uh, medium-term outlook, even though uh, the, the market is definitely more expensive than South Korea. Um, uh, we really think, uh, uh, you know, there is a fundamental change in the, uh, the inflation outlook for businesses, uh, thanks to the decade of uh, reflationary efforts by Bank of Japan and uh, the government, and uh, we're beginning to see that in the survey indicators. We also we're, we're definitely seeing that in the earnings uh, numbers. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, in terms of timing, the market it might be slightly tricky at this moment because the rally has been rather furious. Uh, but uh, for the medium to long term, uh, the the equity market definitely deserves a strategic asset allocation. Now. For South Korea, um, uh, we are, uh, you know, in the midst of a kind of a corporate governance reform push by the government. Uh, so uh, that's an interesting uh, development to watch. Um, the market is definitely cheaper than the others, and it's, uh, it does have sensitivity to the AI theme. Uh, so uh, we're watching the, you know, the new announcement from the government, uh, this value up program. Of uh, basically replicating the name and name and shame, uh, you know, campaign for the companies that are not using capital well. Uh, so if it's well received by the investors ahead of the shareholder meeting season, then uh, we could potentially upgrade our view uh, for the market. For the time being, uh, we are more neutral, and we still think the momentum in Japan or Taiwan markets are, are worth, uh, uh, you know, reflecting in your equity portfolios. Uh, Homan, you described the uh, rally in Japan as furious. I'm just w wondering uh, to what degree you think it can maintain the rage. Uh, what's your price target for the Nikkei? And can you see a scenario where the BOJ tightening actually helps fuel that rally? We think it's uh, um, possible to, uh, you know, high single-digit return from here, uh, just based on our assumptions about uh, growth and inflation in the economy. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, you, you'll see the earnings growth uh, slowing down a bit this year, actually, compared to last year. But uh, there is a lot of uh, retail investor activity, uh, for sure, uh, after the launch of a more generous NISA program. And, uh, of course, uh, you know, the flows picture are changing for the foreign investors, too. So in this kind of context, if you get, uh, you know, a set of uh, uh, relatively encouraging data, then you can still see a bit of upside from here. Um, Obviously, uh, you know, the rally has been quite significant, and not just this year, but since, uh, you know, in the past, uh, you know, two years, really. Um, so uh, th there is a bit of timing issue. Uh, right now, our allocation to Japanese equity is neutral. 
Uh, now, whether or not the equities, uh, you know, uh, can withstand the potential rate hike by the Bank of Japan um, uh, in April is a question. We think they can uh, withstand the hike, uh, especially if the BOJ guidance after the hike is not too aggressive. Uh, so that's another issue to watch. But uh, overall, currently neutral, uh, but we're look, looking for opportunities to maybe um, uh, change that assessment uh, in the next few months. Uh, can we just quickly get your view also on your inflation forecast for China or maybe a deflation forecast could be a, a better description. And in terms of policy measures in China, do you feel that they've been a needlessly timid perhaps? So first of all, uh, the, our inflation for we lowered our inflation forecast for China recently uh, in, in the aftermath of the January, very disappointing January report, uh, which showed, uh, you know, headline inflation at negative 0.8 percent year on year. Um, uh, so the rebound scenario we have to be uh, more realistic. So we're looking for 1.3 percent average CPI inflation this year. And we acknowledge that there is still uh, quite a bit of downside to that risk. Um, now for the policy action by Beijing, you know, uh, we're seeing some uh, steps in the right direction. But um, the, our overall assessment is that uh, the approach uh, is still quite piecemeal and reactive. Uh, we can focus on, for instance, 25 basis point cut in five-year uh, loan prime rate. Uh, you could question, you know, why you know, didn't they do this in January? Or, you know, why limit the move to just the five-year loan prime rate? Um, there are concerns about, you know, the renminbi stability or the net interest margin for the commercial banks that are constraining these actions. We understand the reasons why uh, they are uh, approaching the topic this way. And of course, there is a bit of positive growth in the economy, but it's really important to come up with a credible reflation package so that it's not just about inflation this year, but you can assure investors that there will be positive inflation in 2025 and beyond. And in that regard, uh, we think the, the policy announced so far uh, might not be enough. And, you know, this idea of a perfect technical tweak to stabilize market sentiment, uh, it, it, it's somewhat dangerous in our view, uh, given the set of challenges that the economy faces. So we'll see what kind of, a, you know, policies they announce uh, in the upcoming National People's Congress. So uh, that might change the tone. But for the time being, we're a bit cautious. Uh, uh, regarding the economy and the market uh, move. All right, Herman Lee, senior macro strategist there at Lombard ODA. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, let's just take a quick look at how SK Hynix is doing. 5.3% uh, gain, perhaps not surprising, considering what we saw with uh, NVIDIA rising 16% after that uh, earnings announcement in the U.S. and tech uh, rallying hard in the U.S. as well. So SK Hynix right now outperforming the broader Kospi. And I'm sure Japan ship stocks will be doing well today as well with the Nikkei not closed for the Emperor's birthday, but SK Hynix having a strong day there in South Korea. Still to come, the first US-made spacecraft in more than 50 years has made it. It's on the moon. We're going to bring you pictures of that landing as we get them. This is Bloomberg. Yeah, if I could just pass on a few words to the end. Saturday marks two years since Russia launched its full-scale invasion of Ukraine. After months of stalemate, the war is turning in Vladimir Putin's favor as political infighting in Western capitals delay deliveries and aid. And the conflict in the Middle East is also diluting global attention. Our editor Michael Heath is here with us now. So, uh, Mike, what, what's the status of the, of the battlefronts in Ukraine at the moment? Yeah, well, I mean, last week we, um, we obviously saw the, the fall of um, Adivka. Uh, of Divka, um, which is in eastern uh, eastern Ukraine, uh, and had been there'd been a, a quite a you know intense battle there, and it's real it's real attrition sort of stuff, slugging it out. Um, as I mentioned before, it's it's almost World War One sort of style fighting, and Ukraine withdrew its forces just because of the risk of them being cut off. 
and there was a lot of concern that, that losing those troops to captivity or, or whatever, it just wasn't worth it for a, a town that wasn't you know, strategically critical. Um, the Kremlin obviously made a lot of propaganda value out of that. But you, Ukraine is obviously under pressure. I mean, it's, it's uh, having to ration its ammunition. It's having to choose where it, where it fights now just because of these delays in, in, um, in USA, particularly uh, getting through to it. And Russia it has the advantage of, of having these huge Soviet stockpiles and a lot more people, obviously, as well. Uh, Russia's also able, been able to get a lot of ammunition from North Korea. It's managed to get drones uh, from Iran and potentially um, and potentially surface-to-surface -surface missiles are being spoken about as well. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, at the, at the moment, it's not looking great for Ukraine, but it's sort of, they're, they're sort of related in a way, these countries. They're both two tough operators, so I suspect it's just going to drag on for a while there. I have been wondering for a while, uh, it what happens if there's a Trump presidency for both of these two conflicts? Yeah, well, look, I mean, it's, it's, it would be really, really concerning for Ukraine. I mean, um, in his first term, Trump sort of made it fairly clear that he didn't have a lot of interest in Ukraine and, and, and its status. Um, he sort of l likes to see himself as an old-style um, operator in terms of foreign policy. Spheres of influence are fine with him. Um, national interests are everything. Uh, and Ukraine just wasn't really on his radar. He was more interested in having a good relationship with Putin than with Ukraine. Now, what would re it would require is for Europe to massively step up. And, and Europe signalled that it's, it's prepared to do this. The problem is that, you know, just the scale of ammunition and the scale of, of weaponry that, that Ukraine requires, Europe, Europe would struggle to meet that, whereas the US has a lot of, you know, is capable of doing that. In terms of uh, Israel, what's, what would be, I guess, worrying there is, is whether... Um, uh, you know, Trump just allows a, a complete free hand there. He's not too worried about two-state solutions or anything like that. I think that's probably what we'd, we'd likely see. Um, so the, the, the US's engagement in these, in these areas would, would certainly step back. It would be, require the rest of the world probably to step up more. And whether they can do that, well, that waits to be, we'll have to see that. Well, President Biden's meanwhile uh, met the widow and daughter of Alexei Navalny and more sanctions incoming. But in terms of sanctions, are we reaching the point of symbolism now? Yeah, there's an interesting podcast on the, on the Bloomberg terminal that, that discusses this very issue. And it talks to, to a, a chap who was a former official at the Russian Central Bank. And he, he'd been very surprised at how resilient Russia's economy had been. It also has um, the first chief economist at the Treasury Department that handled sanctions. It's really worth a read. And so she was saying that basically Russia's economy has reorientated and it's a war economy. Um, so, yes, the growth looks OK in Russia, but in fact, how pe people's living standards are, are pretty poor and deteriorating. The, the guy who'd been at the central bank was, uh, was a bit more upbeat. He was surprised at how little they'd done and he thinks they've run their course. So, yes, there is a degree of symbolism, but it looks like they're going after the military industrial complex, which is exactly what they need to be doing. Bloomberg editor Michael Heath there and taking a look at some of the other geopolitical headlines that we're tracking today and Israel is determined to push ahead with its goal to move about a million civilians from the Gaza city of Rafah ahead of an attack. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says a plan is underway but privately officials have acknowledged that they have no precise strategy on how an evacuation plan can be carried out or where people will go. Leaked documents from Shanghai-based cybersecurity vendor iSoon appear to outline the broad scope of China's state-sponsored cyber attacks on foreign governments. The files, seen as authentic by industrial experts, appear to show successful attacks in 2021 and 2022. Targets include the UK Foreign Office, the Royal Thai Army and NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg. China will renew its panda diplomacy efforts with the US and other nations after spending recent years bringing the bears it loans to foreign zoos back home. China's wildlife agency recently reached an agreement with the San Diego Zoo and the Madrid Zoo. The move marks Beijing's latest effort to improve relations with the West. China has called on the U.S. to stop official contact with Taiwan after a delegation of lawmakers arrived on the island. The group, led by House China Committee Chair Mike Gallagher, delivered a strong message of support on the first day of their visit. They met with President Tsai Ing-wen, Vice President and President-elect Lai ching and legislative leaders in Taipei. You can get a roundup of the stories you need to know to get your day going in today's edition of Daybreak. Bloomberg subscribers go to Daybreak Go on their terminals. It's also available on the mobile in the Bloomberg Anywhere app. You can customise those settings as well so you just get the news on the industries and assets that you care about.
The US-made lander from Houston-based startup Intuitive Machines has touched down on the moon, and it's the first time a US-made spacecraft has made it there in one piece since 1972. Uh, global business reporter Bruce Einhorn is with us now. Uh, Bruce, this day will go down in history for space exploration. Give us a sense of its importance. Uh, this is the first time that a private company has landed on the moon. There have been several attempts. Most recently, another U.S. company sent a, a spacecraft there last month but never made it to the moon because of equipment failure. A Japanese company tried last year, did get to the moon, but didn't land successfully. Uh, so uh, the, the mission now by Intuitive Machines is a real breakthrough. Uh, this is something that uh, is supported by NASA, a uh, part of a NASA program to uh, work with private companies, uh, most notably SpaceX, which, Na uh, which NASA uses for uh, a lot of its launches. Uh, uh, in the future, the goal is for NASA to be able to use these private companies to send missions to the moon. Uh, and eventually, the goal is that the US wants to have astronauts back on the moon uh, and uh, 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 eventually have a longer-term presence there. Uh, the U.S. isn't the only country trying to do, uh, do this, trying to send people back to the moon. Uh, China, most notably, uh, is aiming to send Chinese astronauts there for the first time uh, sometime by the end of the decade. Uh, so there is a bit of a moon race going on, and private companies are part of it. Uh, Bruce, and this has been, it's been an interesting sort of opportunity for investors too, right, as we get an increasing number of launches and private sector players. And take a look at this chart that shows just the, uh, you know, incredible move that we've seen in intuitive machines. We've seen a 300%, just about a 300% gain year to date, uh, a 121% rally over the past three sessions alone. And here you can see just a number of objects that have been launched into space. So this is clearly of commercial commercial interest in addition to the national interest that you've talked about where do they think where do investors think the opportunities lie here uh, um, you're right uh, there there is a lot of interest um, in some companies uh, in intuitive machines the stock price is up sharply in after hours trading not surprisingly uh, uh, the chart that you showed showing the big increase in uh, uh, objects in orbit. A lot of that is due to SpaceX uh, because of its Starlink constellation of communication satellites in low Earth orbit. Uh, earlier generations of satellites were much higher in space and they only needed one or two satellites. Uh, when you're in low Earth orbit, much closer to, to the planet, uh, you need many more satellites in order to get the same kind of coverage. So there are thousands of SpaceX satellites um, as part of that Starlink constellation, and there are going to be a lot more. Uh, um, Amazon uh, has a plan to create a constellation of its own. Uh, uh, others are working on plans, including the Chinese. Uh, uh, as far as investor interest, it is a little bit spotty, though, because uh, there are uh, uh, a bunch of companies, space companies in the U.S. that did go public through the SPAC process. Um, a, a lot of those are not doing all that well. Uh, um, so there has been some concern that maybe this isn't going to be as uh, as lucrative a business as uh, some might feel. Um, but now we see with, with the intuitive machines landing that there is potential there. The big, the big thing we should uh, caution about is we don't know the status of the aircraft, of the spacecraft on the moon. We know that it's landed. The company has said that it has contact, has in contact with it. Uh, um, the position of it, is it right side up? Is it sideways? Uh, is it in the place where they intended to land? We're still waiting to hear on that. So there, there could be some, um, some big bumps coming up uh, that might uh, uh, sort of decrease the enthusiasm level. But for now, uh, what we know is that they have landed um, and that they're in contact with it. So uh, it is a, a successful soft landing. All right. Global business reporter Bruce Einhorn there in that landing zone near the south pole of the moon uh, where there are deep craters and near permanent shadow that are believed to hold water ice, which would have numerous uses uh, in terms of lunar exploration and beyond. And we are anticipating pictures from that moon landing. Uh, we will bring them to you as soon as we get them. Plenty more to come on Daybreak Asia. This is Bloomberg.
Yes, I do believe that we may be in a position to see rates decrease this year. But I would caution anyone from looking for it right now and right away. We have time to get it right, as we must. We always need to keep in mind the dangers of easing too much in response to improvements in the inflation picture. Excessive easing can lead to a stalling or reversal in progress in restoring price stability. All right, take a look at how we're tracking when it comes to this final Friday session and quite a bit of upside support, right? Asian shares are climbing as we saw US equities, no matter how you cut it, hitting record highs. And all of this really down to uh, just the performance of one stock, right? When it comes to the chip makers, it is still NVIDIA. That story really leading a lot of the chip makers in uh, these Asian markets that are trading, in particular the likes of SK Hynix there uh, in the fray. Of course, we have Japan off for the Emperor's birthday holiday. So a little bit of a breather perhaps after the Nikkei 225 finally secured that night, December 1989 high. We're seeing Australia putting on gains of about four tenths of one percent. Kiwi stocks perhaps a little bit of an underperformer, but really it was Nvidia's results as well as the ensuing rally that uh, sparked just the broad based rally that we saw across US equities uh, that we continue to see play out in this part of the world as well. But of course, geopolitics continues to be the overlay to all of this. And Bloomberg has learned that the US and China are discussing new measures to prevent a wave of emerging market sovereign defaults. These talks mark one of the most significant attempts in years at economic cooperation between the two countries. For more on the scoop, let's bring our international economics reporter, Eric Martin, in Washington, D.C. And Eric, this is a fascinating story in terms of some of the conversations uh, that are going on between the two rival superpowers. What measures are being discussed? And what sparked this? Because we know that EMs in this part of the cycle, and even despite the, the linkages to a slowing China, have been fairly resilient. Heidi, what we know is that these discussions have taken place over recent months. We know that um, Under Secretary of Treasury Jay Shambaugh was in Beijing at the beginning of February, and that these are discussions they're really looking at moving forward. Uh, beyond a mechanism that hasn't been working over the last several years called the Common Framework. What we've seen is countries, several countries in Africa that have applied for the Common Framework, but it's taken a very long time to try to work through their restructurings, negotiate with their bilateral creditors, negotiate with bondholders, and come out the other side. And so what we've seen is that U.S. and China, we're hearing from our sources, have been talking about ways that they could delay the repayment of some of these debts of countries that owe a lot of debt to China and owe a lot of money to China. And therefore, they would be looking at reprofiling the debt and paying it back later over a longer time frame, hopefully before they would get to the stage of needing a full-on restructuring where you need write-downs and haircuts and all kind of things that Beijing really rejects as an answer to this, because China is really averse to taking losses on these loans. The loans are spread between a number of Chinese state-owned banks, and nobody wants to be left holding the bag and saying that the bet that they made, the investment that they made, went south. Uh, Eric, uh, as we count down to the G20, there's been a lot of discussion about how the Israel-Gaza conflict is really driving a wedge between members, but perhaps this is this an opportunity for the G20 to sort of get back to its basics and explore an area of agreement and cooperation? Well, it's certainly a promising sign. What we're hearing from our sources is that the kind of mood music, if you will, to these kinds of global conversations is better now, certainly, than it had been in the past couple of years. If you compare where we are today in February 2024 to where we were in February of 2023, when the story dominating the headlines was a spy balloon and everybody was, was fascinated and captivated by that story to where we are now of the US and China having more regular exchanges, having possibility of Treasury Secretary Yellen going back to China sometime this year and just able to talk to each other in a way that they haven't been able to in a number of years. Certainly, this provides a glimmer of hope in terms of tackling some of these biggest problems that really have to be agreed by the world's two largest economies, the two superpowers, and then socialized potentially with the G7, 
uh, and then with the G20 and to get everybody on board. But the first step is really for the two uh, behemoths in the room to be talking to each other and to be having productive conversations. Eric, is the the very framework of the common framework being criticised, though? There has been some concerns that it hasn't been working. Uh, and if so, how could we see a more uh, bilateral approach perhaps be more effective? Well, part of the problem with the common framework is that at the end of the day, people need to accept losses. Uh, you know, it's something that... Uh, the, the private creditors, the bondholders who now make up a lot more of the bond holding and a lot of the, of the debt and um, lending than they did 10 or 20 years ago when it was really the Paris Club and a group of Western creditors, as well as China being the other large new official creditor, um, you know, that these are processes that take a lot of coordination, a lot of tough negotiating. And even with a country like Zambia that we thought sounded like as of last fall, things were moving forward. And then you found a, uh, a hiccup and an unexpected obstacle. And so the idea is if you can get the US and China to agree on some principles about delaying this, particularly, I think it's important to, ha to highlight preemptively, that is before some of these countries get to the stage of a Zambia or a Ghana where they are in debt distress. So looking down the road, say three to five years and trying to get out proactively in front of the problem before it becomes so large. All right, international economics reporter Eric Martin joining us there uh, from DC. Just want to get you across some uh, alert on the Bloomberg terminal. We're hearing from the Fed's Christopher Waller at the moment. Uh, he's making a few slightly hawkish remarks. He says, look, delaying cuts for a few months shouldn't have a big up, up, uh, impact. He says uh, he sees a predominantly upside risks on inflation. Uh, Chris Wallace says he still expects to see Fed easing this year, but there is no great urgency. He wants to wait at least a couple more months uh, to get some more inflation data. Uh, Chris Waller also saying that January's surprise CPI number could be either a bump or a warning on inflation. So we heard from a couple of other Fed speakers today as well. Uh, the Vice Chair Richard Jefferson also saying be on guard against cutting too far in response to falling inflation. And the Philadelphia Fed President uh, Patrick Harker saying it is appropriate to cut this year. But again, uh, he sees a risk to easing too soon. So those remarks really being echoed here by Chris Waller. Predominantly upside risks on inflation and delaying cuts a few months. Well, that shouldn't have a big impact. Right, TSMC will officially open its Kumamoto fabrication facility in Japan this Saturday. Mass production due to start later this year. And it's an early victory for Tokyo in its race to make more chips as governments around the world work to boost domestic semiconductor capabilities. In an exclusive interview, Hisashi Kanazashi, IT Industry Division Director of Japan's Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry, tells us what prompted Japan's move. Of course, you know, uh, Kumamoto TSM5 is very significant uh, for, for Japan uh, because, you know, uh, the fab is uh, kind of a, to fill a gap uh, between supply and demand in Japan. Mm -hmm. So uh, without investment from TSMC, uh, we only have over 40 nanometer technology node uh, in Japan. But, you know, recently the demand for less than 40 nano is getting traction in Japan mm -hmm. uh, by, you know, like uh, Japanese car industry or other, you know, robotics industry, etc. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's why uh, the supply capacity from Kumamoto TFC, TSMC first fab uh, from 28 to 12 uh, is kind of essential. Uh, to the Japanese, you know, industrial activities. We've reported that the numbers could be 20 to 30 billion dollars. It could go as high as 67 billion dollars in terms of financial support for mm -hmm. the chip industry. What would you say to the taxpayers of Japan mm -hmm. who are going to help build this industry? Why is it worth it? I think, you know, uh, Japanese public people already realize the importance uh, of the uh, support for semi-industry. Uh, so what we what we are doing is to you know tell the importance uh, of the, each project to to the public people, of course. Mm -hmm. So the kind of you know uh, economic security pers uh, perspective is the, uh, one of the element, mm -hmm. and the other is economic kind of a ripple effect perspective. As an example, you know TSMC project uh, is expected to have the you know, large scale of the uh, economic, you know, spillover effect. So actually, you know, we already 
have watched semi-related, you know, companies, many, you know, semi-related companies are moving into the uh, Kumamoto Prefecture, uh, where TSMC is, you know, actually constructing their first fab. So, which cause, of course, you know, investment, you know, uh, spillover effect, as well as, you know, create job creation as well. And also, considering the salary level or payment level uh, from TSMC, it is, you know, higher than the, you know, of course, you know, standard level of Japanese companies. Mm. So, uh, which can uh, make a very positive impact uh, in terms of the uh, raising salary level uh, as well in Japan. It seems like Japan has jumped out to an early lead in this effort to build the domestic chip industry. Mm-hmm. The United States is trying to do similar things. Yeah. Europe is trying to do mm-hmm. certain things mm-hmm. also. Mm-hmm. What are the reasons that Japan was able to do this so quickly? Actually, you know, considering the past, you know, uh, w- what we have, you know, thought is, you know, uh, everybody thought Japan is too small, uh, too slow uh, in terms of the financial support. We sincerely regret uh, that misdemeanor <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, for, for the past. So uh, that's why we realize the importance of speed. I have served, you know, uh, a couple of ministers uh, of METI, so everybody told me that speed is very important to attract uh, the investment from our side. That was Hisashi Kanazashi, who's the IT Industry Division Director of Japan's Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry, speaking exclusively with Bloomberg's Peter Elstrom in Tokyo. Well, coming up next, we'll be speaking with the New Zealand Finance Minister. Nicola Wills is along with us uh, on the country's economic outlook ahead of what's expected to be a tough budget in May. This is Bloomberg. New Zealand's Finance Minister Nicola Willis is in Australia this week as both countries aim to strengthen their single economic market. The two nations are looking to lower business costs and uh, increase the ease with which companies and people can operate across the Tasman. And with us in the studio now is Nicola Willis, uh, New Zealand's Minister of Finance. Minister, thanks so much for joining us here. Um, The relationship economically and culturally between New Zealand and Australia probably the closest of any two nations in the world. But uh, what barriers remain? What more can be done? Uh, Well, good morning. Uh, It's been a fantastic uh, opportunity to visit Australia because, as you know, we have a very close economic relationship. The opportunity is to address the challenges that we share together, uh, things like the transition to renewable energy and ensuring that we have aligned regulatory frameworks on that. Uh, Also challenges, for example, with Pacific banking and ensuring that we are supporting uh, the provision of those financial services. But then great opportunity. Uh, From New Zealand's perspective, we want Australian businesses to invest in New Zealand. We are open for that business. Uh, We think we are a great growing part of the world and we want to make that as seamless as possible. Well, New Zealand is, of course, a a small, open, very trade-dependent economy, um, but also vulnerable to having a very high debt burden. So what's Mm. what's the status of New Zealand's debt at the moment, and what's being done to bring it under control? Our debt levels uh, sit at about the same level as as Australia relative to GDP, but we do want to see that track down because, as you say, we are small and exposed. So we, as a government, have been elected with a mandate to get government spending down as a proportion of the economy, and we're working to really drive more more value from the investment that we do do. So uh, reducing the size of the back office public service and reprioritising some government programs so that we can both offer tax reduction and improve the state of the books going forward. So give us a little bit more detail. Is the intent still to return the budget to surplus by 2027? And as you mentioned, the balancing of uh, considered cuts, but also uh, tax cuts as well. Does that sort of square? How, how does that kind of add yeah. up Yeah, the, the, look, the tax package that we have proposed is fiscally neutral, which is to say that it is being funded by a combination of 
reprioritisation together with some new revenue initiatives, uh, including uh, cost recovery for immigration levies, uh, greater tax audits, uh, taxing uh, the gambling regime. So that means that we think our tax uh, reduction plan is prudent and sensible. It will be the first tax adjustment on a personal income level uh, in 14 years in New Zealand. So we've had considerable bracket grief and disincentives for work which we're keen to address. In terms of the surplus position, uh, there is a forecast surplus in 26-27, however that was uh, forecast before Christmas. We have had uh, downgrades in the growth outlook since then, uh, so that is a goal that we are still pursuing, surplus, but it may be a more challenging picture as the surplus posted for 26-27 is wafer thin, $100 million. And the global picture is certainly challenging in many ways, particularly when it comes to key trading partners like China and its slowdown. And I know in the mini budget before Christmas it was flagged that uh, if things were perhaps looking a, a little bit concerning and that if we see a worsening deterioration in fiscal uh, and monetary uh, conditions that you could actually see further declines in revenue. So does mm. that mean there is a risk due to the upside of deeper than expected spending cuts? I think that that is a fair representation of the downside risk to the growth outlook, but in terms of the spending reprioritisation, we're not seeing a need to deepen uh, that program. What we have is an initial program uh, to reduce some cost and then over the longer term we're very optimistic about driving more value from the investment that we're doing. We anticipate continuing to invest more in frontline services, health and education which face uh, growing demand with a growing population. Uh, we anticipate increased investment in our police force. We have a great growth trajectory possible for New Zealand but it's very important we unlock that. Uh, when I spoke with investors in Sydney over the recent days, they talked about how challenging it can be to get permits consent to do development in New Zealand. Well, our government's been elected to cut through a lot of that red tape, make it much easier to invest, and we're confident that by getting those regulatory settings right, we can unlock a lot more growth to put our economy in a much stronger position. Well, in terms of growth, uh, the first half Treasury growth forecast is 1.5%, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, um, but some economists see less than that. Uh, what are your projections? Well, you're right. There are a number of uh, there are a number of predictions out there. None of them are as great as we would like them to be. Like Australia, uh, we face an economy that has had interest rates rise very quickly in response to high inflation, and the effect of an official cash rate at five and a half percent is being felt across our economy uh, as our geostability. Uh, concerns. So uh, we'll see the latest forecasts uh, when we um, present our budget on the 30th of May this year, but we are prepared to make sure that our uh, plans are resilient to uh, forecasts which may decline. Would lower rates be helpful and to what degree are rates at a current setting informing your budget choices? Well I'm always very careful not to comment on where the official cash rate should lie. We have a proudly independent uh, reserve bank. What we are seeing is that inflation has been coming down. It's still too high at 4.7%. Uh, but a combination of factors tell us that the uh, high interest rates are really kicking in. We have unemployment ticking up, we have the growth forecasts ticking down, as you say, and certainly businesses are telling me that they are seeing uh, redundancies, they are seeing retrenchment, and so uh, all the signs are that high interest rates are having the effect the Reserve Bank wants, uh, and that we should see inflation starting to track down. I want to ask you about the foreign buyer plan. Is there a concern, or ban I should say, is there a concern that this sends the wrong message about how open New Zealand is to international business and partners? Yeah, look, uh, the, the rules in New Zealand prevent uh, foreign buyers from purchasing residential property. Of course there's a significant uh, exemption for Australia. Uh, but So we, uh, as a political party, campaigned on overturning that ban. We are in coalition, our partners haven't supported that policy position. What we want to do is make clear that we do want to welcome investment around the world for our productive industries, for our businesses. There are significant growth opportunities. We're on a huge drive to deliver more infrastructure, uh, roading, public transport projects, renewable energy. And our government's really open to doing that in partnership with the private sector. So we're looking at new funding and financing arrangements and we do anticipate that some of that capital will be overseas capital. And certainly uh, what I'm hearing from investors is that they see New Zealand as a great prospect for those kinds of investments. 
Uh, you've also got a plan to deliver a tax package uh, relief of 14.6 billion New Zealand dollars. Um, can you still do that, uh, particularly after one of your coalition partners, New Zealand First, has you know, basically, as a condition of that coalition, forced you to drop that plan to tax foreign buyers? Yes, we can do that. And we've already made a down payment on that plan with our mini budget before Christmas, where we realised $7.5 billion worth of savings. We think tax reduction is important in New Zealand in the context of significant bracket creep and fiscal drag. No tax adjustment in 14 years. To give you a sense, a median wage earner in New Zealand used to be taxed at 17.5 cents on their marginal dollar. That's now 30 cents due to bracket creep. So we have to adjust that to make sure that uh, we are encouraging and rewarding work. We'll be able to fund the balance of our tax package, as I say, with that program of reprioritisation. We're conducting a baseline exercise to do that and with a number of revenue measures. So taken together, we're confident we can deliver it responsibly uh, and our coalition partners are very supportive of that. Minister, we really appreciate your time on your visit today and joining us. Nicola Willis, the, the New Zealand Finance Minister. And you can catch us live and catch up on those past interviews and conversations on our interactive TV function. That's at TV Go. You can, of course, dive into any of the securities or the Bloomberg functions that we talk about and join in on the conversation as well. You can send us instant messages during our shows. This is for subscribers only. Do check it out. It's at TV Go. This is Bloomberg. Pretty bullish way to end out the trading week, even with Japan on holiday. It secured that December 1989 record high, but closed on account of the Emperor's birthday holiday today. But we are seeing green shoots across the region, particularly when it comes to trading in Korea. We see so much of that focus when it comes to uh, that global rally in equities ignited by Nvidia. SK Hynix, in particular, advancing as much as 6.7% at one point to the high since November 2000, really riding on the back of Nvidia, finishing 16 percent higher on that bullish sales forecast. So it's not just about chips, Paul. We're seeing this kind of cast a, you know, a, a, a sprinkle of glitter uh, across broader equity markets and risk assets. Yeah, there really does seem to be a, a halo around markets uh, today and, and definitely yesterday as well after that NVIDIA results. And uh, it's uh, spreading to Australia also. We've got the ASX better by a third of 1% and perhaps unsurprising, the best performing sector right now. It's information technology stocks. Those are better by 1.6%. Uh, but uh, most of the market rallying pretty well. Uh, it's just uh, materials, utilities uh, and industrials that are a little bit weaker. Energy as well. And we've seen uh, the oil price kind of drifting sideways. Uh, across the Tasman Sea in New Zealand, uh, just a little bit of weakness at the moment. The NZX uh, kind of flat. And we did, of course, just hear from New Zealand's Finance Minister Nicola Willis uh, saying that that uh, $14.5 billion New Zealand dollar tax cut package, that can still be delivered. All right, that is it from uh, Daybreak Asia. Markets coverage continues as we look ahead to the start of trade in Hong Kong, Shanghai and Shenzhen. Stand by for Bloomberg Markets China Open. This is Bloomberg.